I, as Brother Newton also asked me, I also feel there are lots of people here who do not know exactly how CFC began 42 years ago. It's important for you to understand what God has done. And uh, I was also praying that as we share God's word, the focus will be on Jesus and not on CFC. If we glory in a man or in our church, we are robbing God of the glory due to him. God says, I will not give my glory to another. And a lot of people have missed out on God's best because they touch the glory of God. We must never do that. But I want to begin with a verse in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 6. So please turn with me there and see Jeremiah was a prophet whom God sent with a particular message when Israel was in a very backslidden state. All the prophets were sent by God when Israel was backsliding to bring a message to make them turn back. Now many people when they hear of the word prophet, they think a prophet is one who predicts the future. That's a wrong understanding. Particularly in the New Testament, a prophet is not one who predicts the future. And a prophecy is not predicting the future in the New Testament. Even in the Old Testament, think of the greatest prophets. Moses, he was not one who predicted the future. He directed God's people, called them to repentance when they worshipped the golden calf, etc. Elijah, another great prophet, he never predicted anything about the future. But he called Israel to repentance when they were worshipping false gods. John the Baptist, the greatest prophet of all, he never predicted anything about the future, but he called Israel to repentance. And every single prophet, whether it was Jonah who called Assyria to repentance, Nineveh, every prophet throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, one thing was common about all of them. They were sent by God at a particular time because God's people had gone away from his ways to call them back. So understand this. This is a true prophet and this is what true prophecy is. And the Bible says we must long for the gift of prophecy in the church because there's a tendency in all of us to drift away from God, maybe a little bit or more. And so there's always a need to call God's people back to his ways, his purpose. That is the purpose of prophecy in the church. And so Jeremiah was at a time when Israel was so backslidden and he preached for about more than 40 years. And his message was always turn back, turn back. And when they did not listen to Jeremiah, that was the last prophet God sent to Israel before he sent them into captivity into Babylon. And when Jeremiah, they did not listen to Jeremiah, they went into captivity into Babylon for 70 years. So this is the message of Jeremiah to the people of Israel. Jeremiah 6 verse 16, thus says the Lord, stand by the ways. You know there are many ways and you have to make a choice. It's like you come to a crossroads where there's not just three or four roads but many many roads and in the history of Christianity very often God's people have come to crossroads like this and Jeremiah's, the Lord says, see and ask for the ancient paths. That means go back to see the way which was right at the beginning, the ancient paths. That was necessary for Israel to understand the way Moses taught them and for us to understand the way Jesus and the apostles taught. He's saying, ask for the ancient paths. And the way we apply that today is, Go back to the Bible and see what, how Jesus preached. Preach like that. See how the apostles preached in the letters, epistles. 
and in the Acts of the Apostles, preach like that. And I want to tell you, after being a Christian for 58 years, there are very, very, very few people I've heard in my life who preach like Jesus and the Apostles, whose way of preaching is like Jesus and the Apostles, and who the message is the message of Jesus and the Apostles. Very few. So this is a very necessary word for our time. Ask for the ancient parts where the good way is. Because the way that Jesus and the apostles taught was the good way, the best way. And walk in it. And if you walk in it, you'll find rest for your souls. This is what Jesus said. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me and you shall find rest for your souls. Jeremiah said that 600 years before Jesus said it. Jesus applied it to himself. That if you want rest in your soul, you must take his yoke. For us, that means to take up the cross and to walk along with Jesus, not to go ahead, not to go behind. The yoke is, you know, we've seen it in the, on bullocks in a plowing field, the farmers, they put a wooden yoke on top of two bullocks, and the one book is experience, the other one has to learn from the older bullock how to plow a straight furrow without being crooked. That's the meaning. Then Jesus said, you'll find rest for your soul. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So Jeremiah is saying also here, if you choose that good way and walk in it, you will find rest in your souls. But Israel said, no, we will not walk in. And I want to say to you that most of so-called believers today um, say it's not possible. We cannot follow all those things in the New Testament. If you compare not only today's preaching, but today's music in Christendom, it's so completely different from the spirit that you find of reverence that there is in the New Testament. The emphasis today is more on instruments and the worldly styles, so different from how it was in the New Testament. So Christendom says, we will not walk in those paths. We have found a better way, better way than Jesus and the apostles. Crazy. And then he says, I have set watchmen over you. See, every prophet of God, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament, is a watchman. And in the old, olden days, the cities had a wall around it. And the watchmen would stand on the walls and warn people of enemies coming. And uh, the prophets of God were like that, warned God's people, there's an enemy coming to destroy you. And... Uh, the trumpet of the enemy was sounded. It says, I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, I, we will not listen. So this has been the history of most Christians throughout the years. They have not wanted to hear the full truth. The different percentage of the truth that people would like, so long as it doesn't make them uncomfortable, so long as it doesn't cause them any inconvenience, we'll accept so much, some take a little more, a little more. But it's always in terms of, uh, will it cause us any difficulty? Will it cause us any reproach? You ask all those questions when it comes to God's word, then you miss out on God's will. Then turn with me to the book of Jude. You know, it's the second last book in the Bible, just before Revelation. And Jude, he's writing sometime perhaps towards the end of before the book of Revelation, towards the, the latter part of the first century. And he says, I wanted to write to you, verse 3, about our common salvation. He says, my burden was initially to write about the message of the gospel, something like the book of Romans, explaining the message of the gospel. That's what he wanted to write. But God changed his mind. And that's happened to me many times when I've got up to preach and I plan on preaching or something and God changes my mind and says to speak on something else. So Jude was going to write scripture and he was planning to write something and the Holy Spirit said, no, don't write on that. Anyway, Paul was going to write Romans, so that's okay. I felt the necessity. In other words, he had a burden in his heart to write, to contend earnestly. To contend earnest means to fight Spiritual battles. For what? To preserve the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints by Jesus and the apostles. That 
precious faith uh, and the whole message of the original gospel which was delivered to the saints which was corrupted even by the end of the first century when Jude is writing it, it had already been corrupted by different people. He says, you've got to fight for it. How many of you, he said to those people in those days, will fight for that original faith which is given by Jesus and the apostles? I felt a necessity to appeal to you. Fight for this spiritually. Fight to battle for this original faith. And the reason is, because verse 4, certain persons have crept in unnoticed into the church. How do people creep into the church unnoticed? That can happen in any church and it has happened in every church in history where people have crept in. They don't come, you know, when you think of creeping in, you think of a snake uh, crawling under the hole of the door. Maybe there's a little gap at the bottom of the door and the, the snake crawls in. And it's the picture here is of somebody who uh, creeps in, doesn't walk upright. There's something hidden in their life. There's some insincerity, some sin, some worldliness, which they try to cover up. But they want to be a part of a good church. And they, ah, it's, hap it's happening in CFC also. And there are people who have crept in unnoticed. It, it happened even in the beginning. But the message was so strong that people just fell away and we want to preserve that message strong so that those who creep in unnoticed and who are not serious about sin will fall away. Because I remember in the early days there would be people coming and then they would hear a few things and then go away. We never went after them. We said, okay, go. Just like one rich young ruler came to Jesus once and Jesus said, there's a problem with you. You love your money too much. Get rid of all your money and come, come to me without your money. Jesus said what no pastor ever says. Go away, go give your money to the poor and you come. I'm interested in you, not your money. That's how Jesus was. That's the original message. You hardly find any church preaching that. And that man said, no, I love my money too much. God, Jesus said, go. He didn't go after him. He didn't say, hey, hang on, come, come, give 10% first and then later on we can increase it later. No, if you don't listen to me, go, go away. I don't want you to come. So that is the stand we have also taken as a church. So if we take a stand like that, these people who creep in will be exposed. We don't stop people from sitting in the church and listening to the message, but they will never be a part of that central core which builds the church. Do you know that all the people sitting in a congregation like this do not build the church? No. Many of you may not even be born again. Many of you may be on your way to hell without knowing it. But in the midst of it, there is a core that God is building of people who are wholehearted and radical and sincere with whom the church is being built. And that will be built and the whole forces of Satan will not be able to destroy that. We've seen that through 42 years and we'll continue to see it till Jesus comes. But it says here, these people have crept in and God has marked them out for condemnation. They are ungodly people. That means there's no reverence for God in their lives. And here is the main sin that they commit, the main fault in their preaching. They turn the grace of God into licentiousness. Or if I were to paraphrase it, they've turned the grace of God into a license to commit sin. Now there was no message of the grace of God in the Old Testament. But grace was preached, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1.17. And all the apostles preached about grace, which is a New Testament word. But people thought, these false teachers began to preach, that grace means God is not so strict like in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if a man was picking up even sticks on the Sabbath day, he was killed. If a woman was caught in adultery, he was, she was stoned to death. If a man had a stubborn, rebellious son who wouldn't keep on listening, the father would bring the son to the gate and the elders would stone him to death. Then now it says those days are all gone and people began to preach that God is not taking sin so seriously as he did in the Old Testament. Now it doesn't matter if you sin because Jesus has died. That is grace. So if you sin, he'll forgive you. You can keep on sinning, he'll forgive you. That is, the grace of God was turned into a license to commit sin. It's like, you know, you cannot drive a car without getting a driving license. 
So there are many young people who wait to come to that age when they can get a driving license. So once they get a driving license, then they can drive the car freely. So grace became like a license. Till then you could not commit sin, but now grace has come. Now you, you can sin as much as you like because you got your license. If the police catch you, you show your driving license. So if you sin, you say, Jesus died for me. That's your license. So grace has become a license to commit sin. And thus when you do that, you deny, verse 4, our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. You deny the very fact why he died. He died not to forgive our sin. He died to save us from our sin. That's very clear. The first promise in the New Testament, he came to save us from our sins, not just to forgive us. And that is the little mistake, that uh, the little error that crept into Christianity in the first century. That's why Jude writes about it. He says, I saw this happening, and so I had a great burden to tell you people who will listen to me to contend earnestly for this faith which was delivered to the saints that grace was meant to deliver us from sin and not as a license to commit sin. And so, as it's explained very clearly in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 6, sorry, and verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under law but under grace. It's a message that we have preached from the beginning, 42 years ago, that sin will not rule over you because you're under grace. Under the old covenant, under law, sin would rule over you. But now, sin cannot rule over you. It, the message is not that you will never sin, but it will not be able to rule over you. You will, you will rule over sin in your life. And if there are sinful habits, over a period of time, you'll conquer them. And if that is not happening in your life, it means you're still under the old covenant and under law. And this is the message that we proclaimed right from the beginning. The grace of God is not a license to commit sin. Stand in the ways and ask for the ancient parts which Jesus and the apostles proclaimed. So when you look at the history of Christianity in these 2,000 years, there's always been this tendency to drift, just like in the Old Testament. If you read the history of Israel, the history of Israel is very instructive. If you read, for example, once the great leaders like Moses and Joshua died, what do you read in the book of Judges? In the book of Judges, again and again and again, you read that Israel, which came with such triumphant power, in the book of Joshua, pulling down the walls of Jericho and stopping the sun and getting such victories. In the book of Judges, they become slaves to the Canaanites. Every tribe became a slave to the Canaanites. What is the application for us today? The book of Joshua is like the Acts of the Apostles where the Holy Spirit came in power and did wonderful miracles and baptized people in the Holy Spirit and formed them into a powerful church, such a powerful church that people like Ananias and Sapphira would drop dead if they tried to play the fool in the church. But what happened very soon, by the end of the first century, it was like the book of Judges. The Canaanites overcame Christianity. Sins, the giants of Canaan, are a picture of the different sins that rule our life. Anger is a giant. Sexual sin is a giant. Is a giant and telling lies and hatred, bitterness, grumbling, complaining, all these things are giants. The love of money, etc. These giants began to rule Christians. And they had the license called grace, forgiven. We go to the blood of Jesus cleanses us. All my sins are forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven. And that's the type of thing Jude fought against. So what happened in Christianity is throughout these 2,000 years, there's always been a tendency for man to drift just like Israel. Drift. Then God would send a mighty prophet like Samuel. And in, after Judges, Samuel came up and then Israel came back a little bit, came back to the Lord. They made a king called Saul. He also drifted away and God had to raise up David. And he also drifted away. Solomon drifted away. And again God had to send different prophets. Elijah. Elisha who brought the people back to the Lord. But again they drifted. 
And like that, God would send one prophet after another. Finally, when it came to Malachi, God said, that's the end. No more Israel. I'm going to send one last prophet, John the Baptist, and he will prepare the way for Jesus, my son. And he's going to establish a new covenant. Then you will discover something that none in the Old Testament could discover how sin cannot rule you anymore. So that is a message that the early prophets in the New Testament church proclaimed. But in the history of Christianity, these 2,000 years, just like Israel, they drifted away. In the first two, three centuries, drifting away was not easy because very few people could join. You know, wherever there was no persecution, like in India now, people joined the church because they didn't have to pay any price. Oh, this is a good group of people. They love one another. They help one another. If we are in some difficulty, they'll come and help us. If we have financial difficulty, they'll help us. If you join the church for all these reasons, you're doomed from the beginning. If you come to the church for some earthly help, I tell you right now, you're a backslider, and I don't know whether you'll ever go to heaven. But people have come to the church for that. The history of India, Indian Christianity is all over. Missionaries came and they gave money and people came and became Christians. And what type of Christians? 95% of people who call themselves Christians today are not Christians in India. 95% of people who call themselves full-time workers. Why did they become full-time workers? They didn't get any job anywhere. They failed in school. And so the ch their parents said, well, uh, our intelligent children, we'll make them engineers and doctors. These ones who fail in school, what to do with them? We'll send them to Bible school. They'll become pastors. That is the history of 95% of Christian workers in India. I know because I've seen them. You mean, that means there was no price. They didn't have a pay, pay a price to serve the Lord. And I've seen in my life around the world that wherever any man, there are genuine full-time Christian workers called by God. There are still apostles and prophets in the world today. But one mark of all of them is they've all paid a price. They've sacrificed something financially. They've sacrificed something in terms of family, comfort. And that's why God has chosen them because they followed Jesus who sacrificed heaven to come to the earth. They followed Peter and James and John who sacrificed their fishing profession to serve the Lord. They sacrificed like the Apostle Paul who was rejected from his position in the Jewish hierarchy and lost his inheritance from his parents because they followed the Lord. These are the people whom God chose, those who made a sacrifice like Jesus, like Peter, like Paul. But all these people who didn't have a job and became full-time workers... Or all these people who made no sacrifice and decided to join a church just because it's a good place to join. I will get some benefit. The moment you think, I will get some benefit in this church, you have lost the principle of sacrifice. The principle of sacrifice is, I will lose something by joining this church. Not I will gain something. And I want to ask all of you, have you gained by coming to this church? I don't mean spiritually. Spiritually, we will gain in a good church. But if you have gained materially and in an earthly way, you better check yourself whether you're really born again or not. It's true that if we seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, other things will be added to us, but it is from heaven. Not like all these missionary work that's gone on in India where people join a church just for the sake of some benefit or to get some recommendation from some school or some, get some free treatment in a hospital and all this garbage that has gone on in the name of Christianity. The Bible says, look for the ancient parts. Do you think people joined the early church for that? And so Lord, God, that's why God allowed tremendous persecution from the Roman emperors. They persecuted Christians and the Christians had to hide in some of these caves. Deep down in the ground. My wife and I had the opportunity to see some of those caves in Rome where you'd go down many, many steps underground where they could meet and if they, they would dig a hole in that rock and bury the people who died. They could not come up and that's where they met. Who would join such a people? They didn't get any benefit. They got rejected. And for two, three hundred years, Christianity was like that. And the devil saw that persecution against Christians is not working because it's making them more wholehearted. 
like even today in China where there's a lot of persecution, some of the finest Christians in the world are not in India, they're in China. Because there's persecution. They're not running after money. They're standing for the Lord. And that's what happened in the first two, three hundred years. And then what happened? One king called Constantine became the ruler of Rome. And he became a Christian and converted all the temples into churches and all the heathen priests were converted into Christian priests and the corruption of Christianity started. That was 300 AD, about 300 years after Christ. From that time onwards, there's always been this corrupt Christianity and in the midst of it, some people will stand against it, this is not true Christianity. All these priests with their robes and crosses hanging around their neck and all. This is not Christianity. Christianity is, must be in the footsteps of Paul and Peter who were simple godly men who had no interest in money, who were interested in leading people to godliness. And a few people would rise like that and the old big, big denominated churches would cast them out as heretics. And they would go out and they would also meet in some place in small hut or in the field. Some of them would be persecuted and killed. So throughout history, in the last particularly 1700 years, there's always been this big thing called Christian church, which is always the dead church. Out of that would come small groups here and there that would meet in the forests and gardens and in small houses and would be persecuted sometimes by the government. And that was the true church. And it's very interesting to see how all through the years, in these 2000 years, God has preserved a remnant of a true church in the midst of this huge Babylonian structure, there'd always be a little group that wanted the truth and came back to the ancient parts. They were always small. Jesus said, the way to life is narrow and very few find it. That has always been the case. Very few find it. I'm, I'm scared to tell you absolutely honestly. I'm scared when a church increases in size. I say, do you think I'm impressed? by this building or so many people sitting here? Not at all. I say, I don't know how many of you are wholehearted disciples who sacrifice anything to follow Jesus Christ on earth. I don't know. Those are the only people God is calling, I'll tell you that. That's how God called me and that's absolutely true of me today. And those are the only ones whom God will fulfill his purpose through. So, then Christianity sank into a lot of corruption and the priests and rulers and bishops and popes all were interested in money. Money became the big thing in Christianity right from the time of the Emperor Constantine and people could become priests and bishops and get money from the people and tell people that God will bless you only if you give him money as if God is some beggar or businessman. He's not a beggar and he's not a businessman. So money has got nothing to do with God's work. But they would quote Old Testament verses and scare people and it's been happening for 1700 years. But every now and then God would raise up some people who were more interested in God and not in money. And that's how he preserved a remnant through the years. And that's the only way he can preserve a remnant at any time. But what happens, you see, think of, I don't have time to go through the entire history of Christendom like that, but about 500 years ago, when all over the world, the big church was the Roman Catholic Church, now, I'm not against any denomination because there are enough, there's enough corruption in Pentecostal churches as in Roman Catholic churches. But that was a big system those days and uh, there, were, there was a time when they wanted to build a big cathedral in Rome and one monk suggested to the Pope that the best way to get money is tell people your sins will be forgiven if you give money and your dead people have gone to hell if you give them money and you pray then God will somehow take them out of heaven into a place called purgatory where they'll be purged and they'll take them to heaven. So people who didn't know the Bible, there were no printed Bible those days, gave money and there was one monk, Roman Catholic monk called Martin Luther who read whatever little Bible was available those days and he saw this is wrong. This is not how we go to heaven. We go to heaven by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And it's by not by our works but by grace, by faith. Faith in Christ we are saved. And he stood against the entire Roman Catholic Church 500 years ago. They tried to kill him. So many people tried to kill him. But God preserved him. And he gathered, that was the beginning of what is called a Protestant Reformation movement. 
500 years ago where people came in numbers out of the Catholic Church. And then there were, in that time, there were another group of people who, you know, Martin Luther baptized babies. He didn't have light on it. I don't judge him for that. He had light on some things, but not on everything. Then there was another group called the Anabaptists who said, no, baptism of babies is not right. The Bible says we must baptize by immersion. So when they baptized by immersion, the followers of Luther persecuted them. It was always like this. One movement would come out and start a good work. And then some people would find something more in scripture, like water baptism, then this group would persecute them. And then after a period of time, it would, that would become corrupt and later on in the 1700s, in England, God raised up a man called John Wesley. John Wesley was one of the godliest men in the history of Christianity. Another man who was completely free from the love of money. And he proclaimed holiness, overcoming sin. And there was a movement of turning people, of people. there were godly people who turned away from sin and lived godly lives. And that became what is known today as the Methodist Church. But if John Wesley came today, he will not join the Methodist Church. It's not what it was then. It was a pure movement when it started. Everything is very pure when it starts. But after it flows for a few years, it becomes corrupt. It's like a river, you know. You go to some river which starts in the mountains, and it's very pure water there. After it has been flowing for some time, it becomes corrupt, spoiled. That's what happens to every these groups as they go along for some time. So John Wesley died and his followers were not like him. You know what is, and then in the 1800s, God raised up other people, wonderful godly men who knew God. They started a great movement and then their followers would drift away. Within 40 to 70 years, every movement would decline. And there was one reason, as I've studied the reason for the failures of all these movements, it is this. Please listen carefully. The founder of a movement knew God, personally. The followers knew the founder, well. So what happens when the founder dies? For some time, the movement proceeds. It's something like, you know, you have an engine pulling a train at a tremendous speed. That's how some of these founders led a movement. And then one day the founder dies, the engine is disconnected. There's a momentum in the bogies of the train that keeps it going for many, many, if it's very fast, even some miles. But slowly it grinds to a halt. Because the engine moved on its own steam or power, but the others were pulled by the engine. So we can learn a lesson from that. And then God has to raise up in the next generation someone else who knows God, who didn't just know Martin Luther or John Wesley or some great man, but knew God personally. We're thankful for these godly men, but beyond these men who knew God. And then God raises up another movement. And that's what's happened throughout history. And then in the early, about a hundred years ago, people began to discover the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you see, nobody had cast out demons and all before that. Uh, way back in Jesus' time, it was there. And so that's the next thing that happened where another truth was discovered about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the original gifts that God gave in the first century, he gives even today. And again, there was a lot of opposition. This is all false teaching. But now, of course, it has become respectable. What happens is any movement when it starts, whether it's Luther or Wesley, they tried to kill Wesley. And even the Salvation Army, which was founded by a man called William Booth, godly man, he and his wife. But it's become so worldly and corrupt today. So this is what has happened to all groups in Christendom. You need to understand this, or I'm just giving you a brief history of Christianity is developed. Always God raises up a man, and then if there are others who know God, who go beyond the man to God, the movement survives. But if they stop with the man, and they don't know God themselves, then the movement declines. It's certainly right to respect godly men. 
and we must do that the bible commands us to do that but it must not be to such an extent that we don't that we lose our connection with the lord himself so we must have a personal connection with the lord i've said that here in the church for over 40 years now that everything you if you've heard it learned the truth of god's word from me you must recognize you have learned it second hand you didn't get it directly from god you got it through me good god is use use human instruments i mean i learned things from paul i didn't learn it directly i've learned things from peter and from james and john but i didn't get stuck with james peter and john i gone beyond them to jesus and that's why i have survived so we must not uh you know i respect james peter and john highly but they don't come between me and jesus so that's very important that this is the only way you can survive to keep the church pure is if you respect godly men but go beyond that and know jesus personally yourself i remember years ago i've said in this church if you must know the lord so well that if one day i backslide you will not backslide because your connection is with the lord i don't believe i'll backslide but what i'm saying is even if it happens it should not affect you that's the way you must know the lord so you must hear every truth that you receive in the church and take it to the lord and say lord make this first hand to me make it real in my life and for that i'll tell you you have to sacrifice the more you sacrifice the more god will do wonderful things in your life because when you look at the cross of calvary there's a message that god is giving to the whole world when you see the son of god hanging on the cross and that is god is saying i run this world according to the principle of sacrifice that is how i run my church and that is how i build my church christ loved the church and he didn't give money to the church christ loved the church and gave himself to the church have you read that verse in ephesians in chapter 5 it's very important any of you who want to build the church please remember this verse ephesians 5 and verse 25 the last part of that verse says christ loved the church and gave himself up for her what did he give not money not supernatural gifts he gave himself he sacrificed himself and built the church and today there are people who want to build the church who do not want to sacrifice themselves you think they'll build the church not in a thousand years no those who come to the church to get some benefit to get some honor they're not going to build the church there's a lot of honor seeking you know particularly those who stand up in front like i'm in front and those who sing in the choir and music they are up in front and there's a great danger all over christendom in every group of those who stand on the platform of seeking honor for themselves and that's the way the devil will destroy them and he's destroyed thousands and hundreds of thousands of uh, preachers and song leaders because they didn't have any sacrifice in their life christ loved the church and gave himself not a little bit of time or a little bit of money a lot of people today they think i'll do something for the church i'll give a little bit of time a little bit of money or i'll give my gifts i'll preach or i'll sing no if you don't give yourself you cannot build the church christ is building the church with those who give themselves who sacrifice that is the principle by which god runs the church there is no other way underneath the church is the foundation of christ died for us so remember this and that is what we have emphasized from the beginning and god tests us to see whether we'll sacrifice and that's how cfc began as well you know jesus christ was born in a cow shed the little basket in which he was kept was the trough or the little 
thing in which cows were eating their food. You know, the food for cows was put in what is called a manger, in that little uh, wooden, I mean stone tub in which the food for the cows was kept. That was the only place the baby Jesus could be kept. And that's what the angels told the shepherds. There are many babies born in Bethlehem tonight, but how will you find the one who's the son of God? Go and look for a baby that's kept in a cow shed in the eating trough of the animals, of the animals. That's the, so all the others will be kept at least in some bed or on some sheet. But the son of God you'll see born in a, the lowest, most degrading place of all. That's where this, you'll see the body of Christ. Now there's a principle there. Why did God allow Jesus to be born in that manger, in a cow shed? God had planned the birth of Christ from the time of Adam, from the beginning of the history of the universe, from before time. Don't you think God could have planned in such a way there'll be at least one room in one hotel in uh, Bethlehem where he could have got a room? It would have been very easy for God to do that. Or Joseph came from Bethlehem, there are so many of his relatives there. God could have arranged for one of his relatives to give him a little place for the baby to be delivered. Even the relatives who don't know you so well would be glad to give you a little place if your wife is delivering. Why is it God didn't allow any of them to offer Joseph a room? Because he wanted his son to come lower than all human beings. Because that's the only way he could lift up everybody. You can't lift up people if you're on top of everybody. Today's Christian leaders are rulers. They're on top of everybody. They've got titles like reverend, right reverend, doctor, bishop, archbishop, pope. They're not underneath everybody like being born in a manger. They're, on, they're rulers sitting on thrones. No wonder Christendom has gone the way of Babylon and the way of the devil. Where are the people who follow the principle of Jesus who offered himself as a sacrifice and came underneath everybody so that he could lift up everyone? And I'll tell you the people who are going to be the greatest blessing in this CFC church are those who are willing to take the last place and be underneath everybody who desire no title, no position, no honor, no money, but are willing to be despised and underneath everybody they can lift up everyone. You can't sit on top of people and lift anyone. You know there's a time we read in John 6 when they, after Jesus fed the 5,000, they wanted to make him a king. You know what he did? He ran away. He went into the mountains. He said, I didn't come here to be a king. I came here to be a servant. And that is why in our churches we have always taught that an elder brother is a servant. He's not a king. He's not a ruler. Our senior elder brother, Jesus, on the last day of his life on earth was washing people's feet. And that's what a true elder brother does. He's at the feet of the others to serve them. And that's the type of elders God has raised up. And anyone who sits on top of them wants to be a ruler, wants to boast that I'm a CFC elder, God removes him one way or the other. Because he's not at the feet of people. That's happened. That's also happened in some of our churches. So you see, it's very easy for Christendom to drift. It's very easy for elders to drift from that principle of Jesus, the principle of sacrifice. And we read that that is how the first true church was built by people who forsook everything and sought the Lord. They did not want anything. They only sought for the power of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, they were waiting, waiting, waiting. And you ask them, what are you waiting for? We're waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit. How will you know when you have received the Holy Spirit? Listen, listen to this. Today, if you go to some Pentecostal and ask him, how will you know you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit? All of them will give you one answer. You will speak in tongues. But listen to this. If you had gone to the, those people who were waiting in the upper room in Jerusalem before the day of Pentecost, they waited for 10 days in prayer. And if you had asked any of them, there were 120 of them waiting in prayer, how will you know that you have received the Holy Spirit? Nobody had spoken in tongues till then. They, would never, they didn't know anything about tongues. They would not even have said tongues. You know what they would have said? Jesus told us before he went to heaven, Acts 1.8, that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon us to be witnesses for Jesus. Right now we are scared. But we will get power. 
And right now we are not able to live the type of Christian life that can be a witness for Jesus. But we will get power to be, not to bear witness with our mouth, but be a witness. And then we will know we receive power. That is the answer they would give. But see how that message has been corrupted. And the multitudes of Christians who don't even read the scripture to ask that question, what would the first Christians have been seeking for when they were waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How would they know they received power? Why is it people listen to all these third-rate Pentecostal people who tell you a lie that the mark of it is being speaking in tongues? I believe in tongues. I thank God for the gift. I've used that gift for 42 years and I'm very thankful for it. But it is not the mark of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've seen people who speak in tongues who commit adultery and who are wayward and who are backsliders and who will finally go to hell. That's not the mark. But I've seen people who are baptized in the Holy Spirit who become flaming witnesses for Christ. Their life changes. Their attitude to sin changes. Their life become, comes out from darkness into light. And when they speak, there's such an anointing upon them. It is not clever words. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that comes straight home to your heart. That is what we must seek for. I told the Lord long before, I, when I was seeking the days when I was seeking, I said, Lord, I don't care whether I speak in tongues or not. I don't want, I'm not seeking for that. I want power. So I'm just showing you how Christianity drifts when you don't follow the Bible. And nowadays when we have a Bible in us, in our hands, there's no excuse for, not, for going astray. So that is just a little introduction to how we see in Christendom the same thing happened in Bangalore also. You know brother Ian, he was the assistant pastor in a Baptist church with another Canadian man who was a pastor. And when that Canadian man was going away back to Canada, he was a friend of mine and he came to me and said, Zach, will you please become the pastor of this church? And Ian is the assistant pastor. I said, I'm willing to preach there every Sunday on two conditions. I will have no title. I'll always be Brother Zach, that's all. And secondly, I will receive no salary. If you accept these two conditions, I'll come. And um, they said, we'll give you some money for your scooter, petrol, so that you can come and visit us. I said, no. Then you'll complain that I didn't visit you. I'll come and I'll put my own petrol in at my own expense and come and visit you. I will not be a slave of any man. That's what I told them. If you accept these conditions, I'll come. Otherwise, go and find somebody else. So they accepted it. So here was a church which had an assistant pastor, but no pastor. And I was preaching there every Sunday. But all that time, when I was preaching, I had a gift of preaching, but I was defeated in my life. My thought life, my inner life, my external testimony was very good. I didn't take money from people, I was not fooling around with women, but my inner life was defeated. And I was seeking God and said, Lord, have mercy on me. What to do? I didn't know how to get out of that situation. I even considered quitting the Christian ministry completely because I said, Lord, I'm a hypocrite. I'm preaching things which are true, but which are not true in my life. It's not the way I started my Christian life. When I started my Christian life, I was very zealous when I left the Navy and I wanted to serve the Lord. I was very sincere. But over a period of time, I didn't find fellowship with others. Or most of the people around me were all defeated. I could not find a single person who could lead me to an actual life of victory over sin. I remember as a young man once going to a, a missionary who I thought was a godly man. I said, brother, can you please tell me how I can have victory over dirty thoughts in my life? He wouldn't give me an answer. He changed the subject. Now when a man changes the subject, you know that he doesn't know the answer. So that's how I couldn't have find help from anyone. So I said, Lord, I'm not going to continue like this. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Please do one thing for me in my life. I said, make my inner life exactly the same as my outer life then I'll continue to serve you. That's all I'm asking you. I don't want speaking in tongues or anything. And one day I remember, it was January the 12th, 1975. I remember the date so well. 
we had a visiting speaker that day in, a, in that church and he he was from England and he always he was going to preach on baptism in the Holy Spirit and um, I had heard him at other times when he had visited and I always knew every single time in every meeting at the end of the meeting he always announces those who want baptism in the Holy Spirit come forward and that day when I went to uh, that church I had decided when he makes that invitation I will go forward and the Lord said to me are you willing to stand up in the presence of that church and tell them I I'm a hypocrite. I've been preaching things which are not true in my life. I said, yes, Lord. Today, when that man calls us people forward, I will go up and I will say that publicly in the presence of the whole church. I don't care what they think of me. I want God. I want God more than the opinion of men. And I'll tell you something. When that day comes in your life, when you want God more than the honor of men, God will meet with you. Maybe that day has not yet come in your life and that's why he's not yet meeting with you. You still want some honor from somebody for yourself. That day, I had died completely. Dead men don't deserve, want honor and I didn't want any honor. And I went to the church for that Sunday morning meeting on January the 12th, 1975 and he did not give an invitation. I didn't know what to do. He closed the meeting and that was the end of the meeting. And the Lord said to me later, you, I saw your sacrifice. You were ready to get up and acknowledge. And that was enough for me. The people sitting there are bigger hypocrites than you. There's no need for you to confess to them. So I came home disappointed. But I'd invited this brother home for lunch. So he came, came home with me. And I told him, brother, I've been praying for baptism in the Holy Spirit for so many years and I don't know what to do. I've just sort of given up. Anyway, after lunch, she said, let's go upstairs. I was living in our old house and pray. And we didn't pray for long, less than five minutes. And he said to me, Zach, it is unthinkable that God will call you to serve him and refuse to give you his power. I thought of that and I said, that's right. I knew God had called me to serve him. How can he refuse to give me his power? Then I realized it was my unbelief. Unbelief was like a closed door in my heart that was preventing the Holy Spirit come to fill me. You know, because I had grown up in the Brethren Assemblies and they always they never taught about baptism in the Holy Spirit. So I grew up in an atmosphere inhaling the fumes of unbelief for so many years. Now, I don't criticize the brethren or anybody else. There are many godly people among them also. But I'm talking about my problem. I was just full of unbelief and it was a tremendous problem. I thirsted and I prayed, but I had no faith that God would do it. And when you don't have faith, you can't get anything from God. So when he said that, suddenly, I cannot explain how, I suddenly had faith. That's right. God cannot refuse it to me. So I knelt down and I prayed, Lord, thank you for hearing my prayer, for filling me with the Holy Spirit. And he laid his hands on me and rebuked the spirit of unbelief. And I suddenly found myself uh, not speaking in English anymore, but uttering some syllables which I had no intention to speak. And I stopped and I went back to English. And I continued to pray. And again I found myself going into speaking syllables which I had absolutely no intention to speak. Anyway, when I finished, I said to this brother, what happened? He said, you just spoke in tongues. Now he never mentioned tongues to me at all. And I said, wow. Okay. Anyway, tongues or not, I knew that God had met with me that day. I was sure of it even before I spoke in tongues. So when I came down from my room upstairs, my wife saw me and she said later, I knew from your face something had happened, that God had met with you. Because she herself had been baptized in the Holy Spirit six years before that. And she had received the gift of tongues six years before me. So 
that was the beginning of our experience. And the next day we had another meeting in the church and Ian Robson, who had also been praying together with me, he received the gift of tongues as well, was assured of baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that's how we began. So once we received this, we said, now we've got to preach it. And so I began to preach that regularly for the next six months in that church. And that was a Baptist church that does not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they were very upset with me. And finally they were speaking a lot of things among themselves. I heard about it and I called the board members and I said, listen, I'm not here to cause any trouble to you people. I'm a peaceful man. If you, you called me to speak here. Now if you don't want me, just tell me to get out, I'll go. They said, yes, we want you to go. I said, okay. I go, I will not cause any problem. I will not cause a split in this church. I will not ask anybody to leave. Will you please give me a chance next Sunday to speak, give one last message? They said, no, we won't even give you that chance. I said, okay, God bless you all. But then the next day they called me up and said, okay, we give you one last chance. You get up and speak. So I spoke that Sunday, that was in July, uh, August, sorry, 1975. And I said to them, brothers, I love you all, sisters, brothers and sisters, I love you all. You have come to the borders of the promised land. And now you can go in and possess the land or like the Israelites, turn back and be in the wilderness for the rest of your life. That's your choice. But thank you for listening to me all this one year. I'm going, I'm not asking any of you to leave this church. I'm leaving quietly, peacefully. And I stepped down. As soon as I stepped down, Ian Robson got up. They had told him, told clearly, you don't have to leave Ian just because Zach is leaving. He got up and said, if you don't listen to Zach, I'm leaving also. And he left. So we didn't know what to do that evening. We said, okay, Ian, let's meet in our home. We just both of us can pray and seek God for the future. We did not plan to start a church. No. Far from it. And there were previous times when I tried to start a church, it all failed. So I gave up all hope of that. And we just met together for prayer because we were thrown out of somewhere. What to do? That is how CFC was formed, not through some spectacular opening ceremony or any such thing. It was by two brothers who were rejected and thrown out because we preached the baptism in the Holy Spirit and we were united in spirit and we had to sacrifice something. I mean, that had been true in our lives even before. Long before that, I mean, I had left my job in the Navy, which I had a good career ahead of me. And Ian had left his career in the railways to come into full-time work. You know, I've noticed one thing, that God has notices where a man is willing to give up his job. Don't, I don't, we don't tell people to give up their jobs. But if God calls, and God had called him, and God had called me, and then he sees whether we are willing to give up when God calls us. Because, you know, to get a monthly income from a job is a source of security for everybody. Otherwise, how do you live? For a person to give that up and say, I'm going to trust God to take care of me. I remember in the Navy, people told me, are you crazy? Who's going to take care of you? I said, God's going to take care of me. And there was a sacrifice involved in terms of earthly terms that both of us had to make sometime in our life before that. And now, there was a, another sacrifice that both of us had to make in terms of a spiritual ministry that we had in a church and to be thrown out and rejected and we said, sure, we'd make that sacrifice also. First a sacrifice in the world and second a sacrifice in Christendom. And God saw that and he, he builds the church on the principle of sacrifice. What were we standing for? We were not standing for anything for ourselves. We were standing for the truth of God. And we were paying a price for the truth of God. And we started meeting. And if you had asked us that day, uh, what are you planning to start a church? I said, no, we are not capable to start a church. Impossible. We're not apostles or prophets or anything. We're just ordinary brothers who until a few days ago were thoroughly defeated in our life. Where in the world can we start a church? We're needy and we are young. I was 35 and a half years old and Ian was 34 and a half years old. 
for many of you sitting here who are that age, 35, 34, can you think that you can go out and start a church? We, we didn't feel we could do it. And that was good for us. So that it will always be known that it's Jesus Christ who built that church. Not Ian Robson or me. I'm sure of it and Ian is sure of it too. We know the history of it. People give us the credit for it because they don't know the story. And that's why I'm telling you the story. It was Jesus who 2,000 years ago said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He built that church that day in August. It was the 17th of August, 1975. And the gates of hell have not prevailed against it for 42 years. You know how Jesus prayed in John 17? It's a wonderful prayer. I want to show you something there in John 17. He said in verse 9, I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying for those whom you gave me. And I'm praying, verse 21, they will be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, so that the world may believe that you sent me. You know, that is what happened between Ian Robson and my, myself that day, that God made us one. And in all these 42 years, I want to tell you something, this is the honest truth, Ian is not here, but if he were here, he would testify to it. There's never been a single day in all these 42 years that we could not speak to each other, or we had some grudge against each other that we could not. The devil has tried so many times to come between us, he's never succeeded. Jesus prayed that we might be one, and that is what Jesus did in both of our lives that preserved this church. Did we disagree with each other? Many times. But disagreement is not the same as disunity. A perfect agreement in the mind will come only in heaven. My wife and I, we never look for agreement in everything on earth, but we look for unity. And that's what's preserved our home and our children through all these nearly 50 years that we've been married. It's unity, very, very important. The devil always tries to separate the unity between two elders or between a husband and wife. Preserve that. And that's how the Lord preserved us and led us forward so that Satan could not come in between and create a problem. When we disagree, we talked, we, Ian and I have talked to each other freely and openly, but we made one decision that we will not move forward if we are disagreed. So if he suggested something and I said no, we wouldn't go forward. I suggested something and he would say no, we won't move forward till we are both agreed. Then we'd move forward. That's what's preserved us and that's the same principle we have followed with the other elders who come along later. So I just want to tell you, and this is just by the way, I want to also tell you, this is how every other church in different parts of the country has been started. There are maybe 70, 75 churches now in India and other parts of the world. They were none of them, none of them were started by me. A church, a church started by me will be destroyed very quickly. God, in his sovereign way, did something, gathered a few people together and brought something to birth. You know, it's like a, when a mother is giving, when a woman is giving birth to a baby, there can be a midwife who is there to help deliver the baby. That's all I was. The baby is created by God. That's how a church is always created. The same thing happened in Koteam, Tutukarin, different parts of the world. It's been the same thing. God has sovereignly brought people together and he's given me the privilege of sometimes being just like a midwife there to help them come together and encourage them to press on. So that's how we started. And through the years, we've, in the, one of the tremendous blessings we had right at the beginning, listen carefully, is that we were criticized, hated by Christian believers all across this country. People told false stories about us. They said that I was pulling people's tongues to make them speak in tongues and all types of stories. And uh, they called us heretics because we were preaching the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which was not so accepted 40 year, two years ago. Now it is more accepted. And we were also preaching that we could follow in Jesus' footsteps because Jesus became a man just like us. 
He was tempted like us. And he overcame. And he gave us the power of the Holy Spirit. Because of these two doctrines. And that we were starting a church. Where there are no leaders and bishops and reverends. And where money was not the big factor in us. Because of these things. There was a lot of opposition. We were under reproach. There was a covering of reproach. Over our little group. And people saw that covering of reproach and stayed away. That was good for us. When a church becomes popular, there's danger. That's why we are in danger now because unfortunately CFC has now got a little reputation as, oh, it's a good church and it's got a good reputation. You think I'm proud of that? I say if we are a burning testimony for Christ, we will be despised because of our stand on holiness and we are still despised by many people. People warn against us even today around the world and that's a covering of reproach in the Old Testament tabernacle. Very interesting to see that inside, the curtains inside were made of beautiful gold thread and purple and it looked beautiful inside but on, on the outside God said put a, it was a dirty brown skin ram skins, tanned, and with all the dust of the desert, it looked dirty brown. The tabernacle, if you looked at it from the outside, that tent was a dirty brown structure. You went inside, beautiful curtains inside. So I learned something from that. The true church of Jesus Christ has got a covering of reproach that others will look at it and despise it. The Bible says about Jesus, he was despised and rejected by all men in Isaiah 53. Let me read that verse to you. Isaiah chapter 53, it says in verse 3, the last part, he was despised and we did not esteem him. We hid our face from him. He was despised, verse 3, forsaken by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Men hid their face from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. That is the first body of Christ. Until the end of his life, when he hung on the cross, he was despised. How is it that today Christendom has become so popular and Christian preachers are like film stars and the Christian preachers have made money from the poor people in the church and become millionaires and they buy their own private planes and things like that? How has that happened? It's because Christianity has drifted away from that original body of Christ. We're not following Jesus anymore. Today's Christian preachers are following film stars and uh, political rulers and all that. I mean, you see what's happening in America. They're admiring the president and all that type of stuff. That's not Christianity. No, I, I disagree with it. I say Christianity, we follow Jesus, who was the godliest person that walked on the earth and he was despised and rejected till the end of his life. Because he exposed sin. You know, a lot of people today preach that Jesus has come to give you health and wealth. And healing and prosperity. But is there a single human being on the earth who doesn't want healing and health and prosperity? Can you tell me? The poorest beggar on the earth wants health and wealth. The wealthiest billionaire on earth also wants health and wealth. Everybody on earth wants health and wealth. And if that is the message Jesus came with, I come to give you health and wealth, the whole world should have accepted him. Why did they kill him? Why did they reject him? That is the clearest proof that this health, wealth gospel has come from hell. Jesus did not bring it. And why is it so popular? Because it's a message Jesus did not bring. The message Jesus brought, he was despised and rejected. Because he preached overcoming sin. He said, you've got to hate your father and mother. You have to give up your attachment to property. You shouldn't seek for honor. You've got to die to yourself every day if you want to be a disciple. And that's what we preach from the beginning. I want to tell you a few things about what we taught in the early days. First of all, we realized that Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples. 
There are two commissions. In Mark 16, it says, go and preach the gospel. Many people were doing that in India. Praise the Lord. But we didn't see many people preaching, making disciples, which is the other part of the commission, Matthew 28. So we said, we look, it's like a, you know, there's a big log of wood and 99 people are at one end of that log and one man is at the other end of the log. Where will you go and help? If you're sensible, you'll go and help that man who's one end. So we felt that the commission that God gave was like, had two parts. One, go and preach the gospel to everyone. The other part was make disciples. And we saw 99% of Christians were doing that part. We're not against it. But there's only 1% of people preaching discipleship. So we decided this is what we're going to do. And in preaching discipleship, we had to see the conditions of discipleship. Jesus laid down in Luke 14. Number one, verse 26. Number one, hate father, mother, brother, sister, and love me more than everybody else. Number two, carry your cross. In other words, love me more than your own self. And number three, forsake your possessions, which means don't hang on to earthly things. Let, keep them in your palm, but recognize that they belong to God. You can have them, but don't possess them. So there are three things which are the conditions of discipleship. One, love Jesus more than your, any earthly person. Don't let your father and mother tell you how to, whether to follow the Lord or not. Don't let your wife or children tell you how to follow the Lord or not. And secondly, you must die to yourself every day if you want to be a disciple. And third, you can have possessions, but don't possess them in a tight-fisted way. Remember, they are gods. And I found hardly anybody preaching this. If there was some church, I would have gone and joined it. I didn't find any. We began to preach it. People didn't like it, naturally. Who likes in a country like India, where everybody almost worships their father and mother? Whatever daddy says, mummy says. If the mummy starts crying, we listen to her and do what she says. To preach in a country like this, you've got to forget about what your father and mother say and follow Jesus. <laughs> That's not easy. But we had to do that. And secondly, to die to myself every day when you're provoked by somebody to keep quiet and forgive, that's not a message everybody wants. They say, be a man. Don't be like a woman. It's not like being a woman. It's like being like Jesus. To follow him. When you keep quiet when somebody shouts at you, that's not being a woman. That's being like Jesus Christ. Not being a man to fight back at that person. That's to be like an animal. Dogs fight with each other like that. And I don't want to be like a dog. I want to be like Jesus Christ. So die to yourself every day. And the third thing was don't possess possessions. Don't think of them as yours. If you can use some of it to bless some poor person, do it. So we decided to follow that and preach it. And of course the numbers, not many people were interested in that message. And the other thing we preached was the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We took many months studying Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I want to encourage you if you want to really go back to the first message that we preached, study the conditions of discipleship in Luke 14, 26 to 33, and study Matthew 5, 6, and 7 on your own. We have a whole study of the, of the Sermon on the Mount on our website. You can go there also, the New Testament verse by verse. But we began to preach, be merciful to others, just as God has been merciful to you like you have up there at the back. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Don't just ask for righteousness, but hunger and thirst for a godly life. And be a peacemaker. Don't be a fighter. If people come to fight with you, don't fight. Be a peacemaker. And mourn for your sin. And if you are persecuted because of these things, rejoice. Because that's the way they persecuted the prophets as well. And overcome anger. Overcome dirty, lustful thoughts and love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. And when you give money, don't let anybody know about it. Money, we found, was a big factor in Christendom. And we decided from the beginning that we will not take an offering because Jesus said, when you give money, nobody must know that you gave. How can you do that if you bring a bag in front of a person? Everybody's seeing that you're giving something. Or in some places they put a box in front and make everybody walk up from the line so that nobody can escape and everybody has to come in the line. 
all types of tricks they've got in prison them today to get money out of people we said no how can you do that when jesus said when you give nobody must know what you're giving even your left hand must not know what your right hand is doing where do we find that preached in christian them today we decide we're going to do it okay if we don't have money to buy a land or build a hall we won't build a hall we'll meet in houses or in some park or somewhere but we're not going to disobey god right from the very first day not only in our church for 42 years in all our 75 churches nobody has ever taken an offering and he sunday people say that it's impossible to run a church we've run it for 42 years because if you seek god's kingdom and his righteousness first he will add all other things to you we wanted to prove that in a poor country like india without asking anybody for money without begging without sending any report to any country that's another thing we never did in 42 years we have never sent a report of our work to anybody in india or any other country we don't want any money from anyone If people give they give cheerfully but we don't ask anyone for it and that is how we've done and think of our we've had 200 conferences at least in these last 42 years in five languages and you know how in every one of those conferences we give food freely and those who are willing to accept the accommodation we give that is also free and we have never taken a con- money even in a conference how can you survive only if there is a god in heaven who is going to back you up and say if you honor me i will honor you that's the verse i've always fallen back on lord why are we taking a stand on all these unpopular things because we want to honor you obey your word and god says if you honor me i will honor you and i will make you a testimony in your generation that those who honor me i will honor you that is our calling as a church that's why we are to be like the light powerful light like the salt that means people who taste a little bit of it know there's salt here we want to be like that we don't say that we are the only ones we want to do our part that's why god has called us and we taught in the lord's prayer which is also in the sermon on the mount that when you pray don't keep asking for yourself you know there are six requests in that prayer and the first request is not heal my back ache or heal my cancer no not even forgive my sins you know that the first request in that prayer is our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name forget about my name i don't care if it's dragged in the dust Lord Lord Jesus let your name be glorified in India I have prayed that prayer for all these 42 years and even before that your name is dishonored in this land let it be honored hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come and now it is in the church that kingdom is there one day it will come to rule the whole world and thy will be done in my life as it is done in heaven that is how we pray first then give us this day our daily bread which means lord give me food for which i need a job i need a house and i need to educate my children so that they will get food when they grow up all those things earthly requires also are mentioned in the prayer but that comes after hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done that's what we taught stop praying for your own needs first and i can say honestly before god that's how i prayed even when my children were getting educated i said lord i don't want them to be great in this world I want them to follow Jesus. I want them to hallow your name. I want them to live for your kingdom and I want them to do your will on earth. The rest will come later on. God-centered praying. That's what we taught. And our needs come afterwards. And when we pray forgive us our sins, that prayer taught us don't stop there. Forgive us our sins as we forgive other people. We taught everybody must forgive others. otherwise god will not forgive you that's another message we never heard and don't stop there but from forgiveness deliver us from all evil from sin we went on from there and then finally when it is all done the end of the prayer lord we still acknowledge the glory is all yours forever and ever this is the sermon on the mount and it was goes on from there when you fast we taught people to fast we had many times of fasting don't tell anybody that you're fasting fast in secret and be free from the love of money 
these are all the things and don't judge others you must discern what is right and what is wrong but don't go condemning people and judging them god is their judge we followed all these things and finally what it says there is the way is narrow in the sermon on the mount matthew 7 14 if you want very few people will find it so we knew there'll be very very few people in our church fine jesus said very few people will find it we only want those few i once said to the lord lord i don't want to go over all over india and invite people who want to go to heaven when they die everybody wants to go to heaven when they die i don't want to call such people i want to find people who will deny themselves every day who love you more than their job and their parents and everything else on earth and want to follow you on earth before going to heaven just give me such people all the rest can go and join the hundreds of churches there are that want their money and their singing and everything else they can go there we're not interested in them i am not interested in any of them that's why i don't ask people to leave another church and come here they'll be a much happier there they're interested in music we're not interested in music we're interested in taking up the cross every day they're interested in honor and all that we're not interested in that we want to be despised and uh, have the reproach of christ upon our lives who wants to join us and then finally in the last part of the sermon on the mount he said if you obey everything i say you will build your house on a rock and we wanted our church to be built on the rock all the floods and the storms and opposition and persecution attacks of the devil will never collapse and i also want to say that in this work god has given us some wonderful sisters who cooperated that is not to be forgotten i know in the early days for 6 years the church met in my home and it's very inconvenient when you have four meetings a week in your home with three small children and later on four small children that we had all little babies and we'd never have been able to do it if my wife was not 100% cooperative sometimes people would come from a distance and they we'd have to give them food and that was our job so we're tremendously honored to that god gave us that privilege of uh that the church could begin in our house our inconveniences and sacrifices were nothing i'm thankful that i had a wife who was willing to sacrifice anything to build the church and she did have to sacrifice a lot inconveniences many many things but it was okay when i see the result today we rejoice in what the lord has done now why am i saying this because between now and when the lord jesus returns this church must not lose that vision must not lose its goal and see what we are called to do this in this church must rise up people who know god and who don't know just zack punen and young people remember i told you i was only 35 ian was 34 when we started this work i'm talking about young people if you've crossed that age you're qualified to start a church the early apostles were 30 but you got to be whole hearted radical you must be willing to sacrifice everything and seek to be filled with the holy spirit continuously all the time not just one experience but continuously we want number of people like that brothers and sisters who are willing to pay that price so that there'll be a pure testimony for jesus christ in this place till the day christ returns i want to tell you that god is shows no partiality if he does not find such people the glory will depart from cfc and god will raise up something else mark my words he will raise up something else because he's determined to glorify his name and we will miss the privilege but i don't want that to happen i pray that god will raise up in this church wholehearted radical brothers and sisters who are willing to pay any price to follow these principles and preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace so that jesus christ can be glorified amen let's pray our heavenly father we look back over all the ways that you have led us as a church these 42 years 
and we give you all the glory if it were not for your preserving us and leading us we would have all fallen by the wayside like so many others have fallen better men than us have fallen away but you have had mercy upon us help us lord never to lose that vision never to lose that zeal never to lose that spirit of sacrifice never to lose our devotion to jesus christ and your our obedience to your word help us no matter how unpopular or despised we are to glorify you to be faithful in our stand in relation to money and worldly honor in re- relation to sin in everything lord that your name will be glorified through us we pray raise up a generation of apostles and prophets evangelists and shepherds and teachers in our midst that the work can continue till jesus comes we pray for this younger generation lord do a mighty work there'll be many spirit filled people among them we pray in jesus name amen